Mi a Péter, nem volt? The Hungarian title was similar. It's, it's an exceptional case, not a method that can be used all the time and everywhere. It is actually a case study that I'm going to show to you in the presentation. In 2007 and in 2009, when I was uh, a speaker of uh, the uh, respective activities, whenever I, I've chose, I chose my tropic, I always wanted to give you a comprehensive picture. And I wanted to cast some light uh, on all uh, the tiniest detail. Uh, this year will be different. I won't give you a very exhaustive explanation. I'd like this presentation to be interesting, uh, to have some morals and uh, to give uh, food to thoughts. There is always a question which determines or specifies which topic to choose. Uh, a couple of for uh, for a couple of years, I've been interested in uh, IT security expert engineers' uh, work. Uh, when they work out uh, and install network security solutions and uh, designing and uh, configuration and installing such systems, testing such systems, documenting such systems, uh, um, maintaining and operating such systems and supporting the operation of such systems. So whoever works uh, for these kind of jobs. Um, you know, would this person encounter cases where special skills and abilities are needed and uh, to be applied? No, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to know if it is necessary. It's absolutely obvious that an IT engineer should have uh, knowledge about malicious code and attacks. He must have a basic knowledge about attack types and the operation of attacks. But uh, what I'm interested in is that uh, this kind of knowledge and skills that he has gained uh, uh, are used uh, during his work. Uh, will he have to use them? Uh, maybe he will never ever have the necessity to use them, but sometimes the answer is a straight yes. And uh, uh, my intention is to show you the case study when they are really forced to use such things. And in uh, three different parts of my presentation, I will ask three questions. And those who know the answers of all three questions uh, will receive a Belgian beer from me. So all three. I will sponsor this Belgian bill. It is a company case study uh, that uh, buys licenses to, to encrypt um, hard disks. It is the encryption of uh, full disk uh, uh, data sets, um, all the data on the disk. He needs it because there are some VIP users of the company who have portable computers with the round ports and they store confidential data and they carry them everywhere. So if this notebook disappears or if it gets stolen, then uh, this person may uh, get data that are very sensitive to the company. Uh, so actually it would be a leak. It uh, uh, doesn't mean that they buy the software and install it right away and, uh, and uh, uh, put put it into operation, but uh, they use uh, some caution and they use a pilot system beforehand. There is a management system which is going to be configured, and after the configuration in the central management part, uh, you can uh, produce the installing uh, component, which will be encrypted on the notebooks for the hard disks. In the pilot, they, uh, they've chosen a person, a VIP IT persons, and they are encrypted. A couple of weeks passed, elapsed, and this person sees that after a reboot, the notebook will not get to the usual phase, but will just uh, re rebounce an error message indicating that the 
he, encrypting client application is not installed on computer, and he's quite sure that it cannot be the case because he, they really installed it, so it is an unusual event and also a a discomforting effect because uh, there is only one reboot uh, button and then uh, starts the whole process again. And since you know that his data are encrypted on the computer, so he will be a bit, uh, he will worry a bit about the encrypted data he has on the computer and how he can have access to the encrypted data. Uh, let us just build up um, uh, such an IT security expert advisor who tries to solve this problem for this man. He has some basic skills. He have general cryptography knowledge, learns and reads it. He knows what symmetric encryption means. He knows what AES algorithm means. And he can draw the conclusion that he needs to have a secret key to make a rescue successfully. If it was encrypted symmetrically, then he needs a, a secret key. He, this person doesn't only have general cryptographic knowledge, he also has some product-specific knowledge. He has theoretical knowledge, for example, he knows that uh, the data are uh, encrypted to such an extent that they are always in such a form and whenever there is a need uh, for a program to run in memory and have access to, to the, this data, then they will be uh, disencrypted uh, in a type of, in an on-the-fly way. He knows the structure of the program. He knows that it is not a simple client, but there is a manager uh, with its own database and uh, configuration data are stored and uh, secret keys are stored in this database. And also there is a synchronization process, which um, uh, 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 gives the encryption key to the client then he will get it from the central database and sends it to the client. And he has some practice in installing such a software, configuring such a software, and he knows that under normal operation, the client computer boots a, a kind of pre-authentication interface, which is absolutely independent of the operating system installed on the machine. On this interface, we should give the proper username and password, and only then can the operating system be loaded. Let's take a further step. So he doesn't only know about the products and installing the products, he should have operation, operating experience, op uh, for example, o operational experience. He can handle normal operational events that the person forgets his password and can attend uh, this uh, pre-authentication surface or interface. Uh, he sometimes closes his user drawer and he knows how recovery option can be used in the software and how the the password can be resetted or a, a kind of closure how can be re um, um, disabled or, re or re enabled there are he has also experience uh, which uh, problems that have already been documented, for example, a virus infection of the given computer and the, and the hash application sh should never allow the operating system to, to boot in the safe mode. They don't want to connect the computer onto a network because then infection may spread. And the simplest thing is to remove the virus. That first um, encryption should be opened and then in a safe code it can be booted in. If the operating system is um, loading um, file is injured, then the operating system cannot be loaded. 
again encryption must be removed and the non encrypted content can be can uh, can be accessed an engineer could uh, restore the operating system but at least uh, he can save data uh, rest, uh, um, backup and um, restore data and there are also some unusual things uh, which are, uh, are never um, talked about how the, the situation can be handled those who who support um, operation or who, who is responsible for operating a system uh, for a, can encounter a case uh, when the node, node when the software was installed on the notebook and the whole encryption process started and all of a sudden with a sudden move either it was a power failure or uh, a violent uh, switch off so the computer was switched off um, during normal switch off there is no problem because these software are prepared are written in such a way that that they have a log how far the the disk is encrypted and after a reboot they use this point to go on with the encryption although certain sectors uh, have been uh, surely encrypted by the software if we take a look at uh, the record in the file system this record shows that the whole disk is um, absolutely unencrypted if we have a system which handles the sector sequentially, they are encrypted to a point, but we don't know how far. And the data save must be made of this encrypted and non-encrypted parts. Please try to consider this problem, and afterwards, after the presentation, we can really discuss this. And there is a second case, a concrete case. Not only the computer doesn't get to the point of loading the operating system, not even the pre-authentication interface appears, only an error message gets in, and we somehow must uh, de-encrypt uh, decrypt uh, the situation. Let's see what kind of initial tri trials there are. Technically, we cannot really make backup decrypted data. We need uh, we we need the encrypted data and uh, uh, save it. We have uh, uh, some theoretical knowledge, product specific theoretical knowledge. If a client cannot boot from a hard disk then um, the vendor supports us in two ways and um, there is also an emergency disk to either it's uh, floppy or in older ver version it was only supported or, or it can be a cd in the new versions uh, the system puts a, a free dos on the floppy and uh, the, it is also possible to do the booting cd and uh, then all the ex ex uh, files can be copied uh, by the means of which uh, special functions can be executed after booting in. In the concrete case, we used a flo the floppy solution uh, to a USB port. In order to use these special functions, there are two obstacles after booting. Uh, the first is the authorization obstacle, because the vendor mm, doesn't want anybody uh, anybody to use these functions, because these are expert functions. And with these functions, they can really kill all the data on the hard disk. And for this reason, I invented the following thing. For each and every day, for each and every date, a four-digit number is generated. And if somebody has uh, taken the proper course and indicates the problem, then he will give the four-digit four code um, to the person with which he can authorize himself. Those who participated during the training of for this product um, uh, have certain experience uh, with it and also received this four-digit code during the course. And it has the advantage if he runs into such a program, then uh, the actual data and uh, knowing the actual data and the code, he can also enter at a later point. 
there is no mathematics behind it. You can really uh, find out how it works. As soon as we went over to authorization, then authentication, and authentication is the next phase. Authentication is needed in order to get access to the encryption parameters. There are two ways of authentication. There is a local authentication and the central one. Local means that it is on the basis of data stored on the hardware. Central means that uh, it's in the configuration uh, file of the central database, and through this we can authenticate the system. Our first item is always lo local authentication, but should there be any failure or error? Uh, on the hard disk, uh, and this is this was uh, indicated by the error message as well. Then even uh, there is a high chance that even the local authentications won't uh, uh, authentication won't attempt won't uh, sorry won't work. We ha uh, we have one opportunity less, but there is one opportunity left. Uh, the top administrator should uh, enter, should log on uh, on the management interface, and with simple clicking, the configuration of this notebook can be saved uh, to a client file, and then it can be uh, booted in, and uh, then we can authenticate it. The local IT staff, the, the staff of the member of the local IT who noted down a wrong password, found a password which was um, unoperational. The second problem is that external IT security consultant uh, had no notes about the passwords of the pilot system. He had ideas, but they were wrong tips. Uh, the software doesn't uh, let us have more than 10 tips. And if we have I've had all the 10 tips, then the, here there is uh, a total closure block. It's a very inconvenient situation, and uh, we and we feel very uneasy in such a situation. And uh, I would say that many of you would say that this is where I stand up and quit. This data cannot be saved. Uh, install it again and try to get it from someplace else. But those who uh, have some um, some bites of conscience uh, tries to do some desperate things in a in a certain situation in order to see to save his face. For example. Uh, what would happen if we ask the vendor uh, that we know that there are two authentication methods, but uh, he may have something uh, else that was built into the software? Will this bus take me to New York? Uh, maybe the question doesn't seem to be a very rational type of idea. What can we do in such a case? And the answer comes back, and the answer wasn't positive. They couldn't give us uh, any any idea to solve the situation. It was a kind of poetic question. They said that if they had such a method, they would share it with us. Still, uh, we had some time to 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 move ahead and uh, try to find uh, some uh, solution with a minimum chance. We may have some luck. And during the synchronization process, the encryption key wouldn't, wouldn't uh, or didn't get down to the client disk, but it was not properly encrypted. This hard disk um, should be connected to another notebook, and it will be booted from uh, his uh, other his own disk. A colleague of us did this, and that was an unexpected result. On the other notebook, the antivirus application started to scream that he found malware on the master boot record of this notebook, um, malicious code. And in this situation, uh, it was a it was a great joy for us. 
and a very lucky thing for us because um, some memories uh, came up from the DOS uh, era when viruses uh, went into the boot record and uh, who had experiences with such pro programs and remember certain parts of slides from previous presentations, they probably have a certain idea about the, the solutions of this pro to this program, program. Let's just build on this security expert further. He has some practice in reverse engineering, let's assume this kind of uh, re-debugging, re re uh, reassembling. Reverse engineering is one of the most important um, hacking capability, that's my personal opinion. That's the most important uh, property of a hacker, you should have practice in reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is extremely useful for anybody to understand the exact operation of an application at a deeper level as it is discussed in its documentation and the application is not uh, uh, over complex but there are people who can really really use this for very complex application and all tiny details can be uh, can be revealed from the exact operation of the application I read some license agreements in which um, re reverse engineering, the use of reverse engineering is absolutely forbidden on the given legal program, but uh, malicious programs uh, quite rarely come with, uh, with EU la. EU la well. So let's speak about the master record, master boot record. At the beginning there is an executable program code and at the end there is a partition table a kind of data section, 4 times 16 bytes, with which we, we can produce the first four primary partition. Uh, during booting, BIOS loads it, the master boot record call content into the memory with segmented address to address 000, 000 offset 7 and then control is given to this code. It is important to mention that since the CPU operates in real mode in this phase, the machine code is executable uh, on 16 bits uh, inst uh, even if a 32 bit operating system is uh, installed on the computer. Yeah, it can use 32 bits register, but uh, uh, different uh, operation code is needed for this. The, the code for this master boot uh, record has the primary task to find the active partition on the basis of the partition table and um, load and uh, to load the boot sector and the control uh, IP control is given to this. That's a um, typical Windows master boot record in Hexa. Um, of course, it is not digestible, so let me just show you some, some assembler code. Mm, I don't want to go into details with uh, the XOR and MOVE instruction, push pop instruction. It is not so um, exciting what happens from uh, instruction line to instructions line, but the, the code looks like this in assembly. At the, be at the beginning, there is a memory copy routine with the moves. Um, because the master boot record is in the 7C00 offset in the memory, but later on the code of the active partition will be stored here. And this code uh, will override itself, and it is not very fortunate. So as a first step, uh, the relevant part of the MB MBR code is copied to another uh, address of memory. If um, the MBR code is over this step, then um, on the basis of the partition uh, table, we must search for the we must search the active partition. These four times sixteen bytes um, record uh, always uh, the first byte always means the status of partition if it's zero, then this partition is inactive if it's one. one. If it's eight zero eight one eight two. Uh, which is a signed number, a negative number on the first byte. Then 80 is the first one on the first uh, hard disk, 81 uh, refers to the second disk, and so on. This code uh, tries all four 
records. It's not enough to find an active partition for the first attempt, but he will look through the 16 as to the whole table and uh, checks if there are any active partitions. If three partitions are inactive and one partition is active, that's the desirable case, a uh, good case. If all four partitions are inactive, then a, a uh, persecutor report message appears on the screen. If there are other errors, then an invalid partition table error message comes up. And uh, the machine gets into an infinite loop. The processor gets into an infinite loop. And if we take a further step and we, we found the active partition, then we should check the location of it on the hard disk. In the case of small size hard disks under 8 gigabytes, that's what I mean by it, there are no real problem. Um, BIOS have a traditional read operation uh, which specifies the sector on the basis of CHS, cylinder head, and as sector. CHS, cylinder head sector. So it's not an absolute uh, uh, number which specifies the sectors, but gives the cylinder, the head, and the, the sector. S CHS limits us to the uh, 8 gigabyte size. If we have a bigger uh, disk, and if the boot sector is above 8 gigabytes, then with this traditional read operation, uh, we cannot access this, uh, address this sector. So then the control must be performed where the boot sector of the active partition falls. If it's under 8 giga, then we don't need LBA support. We can use the standard 0 to function code where with the traditional read operation, if there is LBA support, then then we have a, a 4 to code read operation which should be used instead. It doesn't matter for us which one happens, but um, uh, it will read the code sector of the active partition on the basis of the entries of the partition table. But there is also an interesting thing here. Should the reading operation fail, then um, and there is a typical error message error routing operating system, but there is one exception from the rule, and it is the FAT32 Windows 95 FAT3 partition. In this case, the active partition, we check the type of the active partition, and the system will try another attempt. You can see three, instru three instructions in the blue part at uh, the ADC. Uh, with these three instructions, uh, 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 it moves forward six sectors from, from the present sector and reads the sector, uh, six sectors after the given sector. Uh, my first question, which goes for beer, what is the task of this code? What can we uh, achieve if we don't read the active sector of the partition, but a code pointing at a sector six by down, down the line on the six sectors down the line? You may think it over. Why does it read, uh, instead of the active sector, the sixth sector behind it? And uh, if we uh, were successful in reading in uh, the boot sector, then uh, the, the system checks the last two bytes. Every boot record has a traditional ending, AA55, 55AA, and this is the end. And uh, if this is the end, then no missing operating message uh, appears. And then the, the active partitions boot sector is loaded and only control must be given to it. And this is the task of the MBR code. Let's move on. We mentioned reverse engineering, and we can connect the two things. Uh, we're talking about MBR uh, reverse engineering. I'm usually interested in reverse engineering malicious code. 
uh, on a personal note, people who reverse engineer uh, codes started out somewhere. I began back in 1994. The reason was I bought a hard disk for my computer, which was passed on to me with a feature, a hardware test program. And what they didn't know, and wouldn't tell me, obviously, they didn't know that the hardware tester was infected by a virus. I realized that in a week, a neighbor borrowed from me a minesweeper, minesweeper program, and I began checking the hard disk. I also checked the floppy diskette and I found a 22 kilobyte uh, program. Uh, it was infected by the back from a 2000 virus. And there are various options. Either you borrow an antivirus uh, program from someone, or I could have run back to the service station and ask for an exchange. What I did was I printed the screen image of the code. And I began to reverse engineer it. If you've never done that, 2,000 bytes took me two days at the time. That was the content. Coming back to this company notebook, the master boot record had this content. I displayed it hexadecimally because the content you see up in the slide, I inserted that into a file and then I made the file the input of, of an application. And my question is, what is the application that was popular on, under DOS? And it is still there for Windows XP, which will accept this as an input file with this content. Uh, that's the second question for a beer as a prize. So let's analyze this jointly. This is the disassembled code. I'm not going to display each line and explain what goes on in them. I will just highlight the key features. Last year's presentation touched upon Intel assembly. And uh, I hope you saw that presentation and uh, you recall how uh, it works. And uh, here you find the important stuff. Uh, subtract SUV sub. And I put a comment next to it. It reduces the RAM top size by two kilobytes. Now, what's RAM top? It goes back to the DOS period when Bill Gates allegedly said that 640 kilobytes must be sufficient for everything. And this 640 kilobytes uh, was dubbed conventional memory. The RAM top indicates this 640 kilobytes hexadecimally it can be described like this. And the hexadecimal value should be stored in the comment. Uh, 0413, that is. And most DOS viruses, the memory resident viruses, which don't just run on one occasion, they become resident in the memory, waiting for their next kill. And what they did was they reduce the size of the RAM top. And the new RAM top value above it, but below the 640, um, they would copy their own code. And that's important because one of the DOS interrupts is about checking this memory area and enables the DOS-based uh, programs to run their memory allocation, which is a way of uh, protecting their own code. We see a two kilobyte reduction in size. So that means the malicious code will be uh, maximum two kilobytes in size. 
Now this malware also contains a memory copy routine at the very beginning, and it does the following. First of all, it reads the 512 bytes in the master boot sector and copies it into the new RAM area, and another two sectors whose addressing is as follows, 3D hexadecimal 48 plus 13, that's about 61, so it's sector 61, and sector 62, the contents are copied consecutively, so 1.5 uh, kilobytes worth of information is copied. And this consists of the master boot record and two other sectors. Continuing to look at the sector, there's a XOR operation dumping the register and um, code neutral operations. And then four important lines follow. The first of these is the interrupt vector table. One, three is the interrupt vector. That's the bias uh, disk manager, including all the operations. The original address is copied into a vector register and two lines further down. Uh, the register content is written into the code, and it will divert the 13 interrupt code by giving it a new offset um, 006A address and a new segment address that's ramped up in this case. And then it will hand over in the last three lines, it will hand over control with tricks in the operations to the code saved in the RAM top. I will also show you another important feature, but I'm not going to give you another, a step-by-step -step analysis of how this malware operates. And this one is about another sector read step, which is 3F hexadecimal 63, sector 63, is whose content is read into the memory, and an already known 7C00 offset address is used to store that new content. Just as a reminder, that's, as, uh, that's where we've uh, loaded the MBR uh, code, not the infected code, but the normal code. And then a jump instruction can be seen here, and our malicious code will hand over control to that memory address. The third question is, let me add to this, what may have been the sector's content in position 63? But I'll answer my question. That's the pre-infection master boot record content. So the third question deals with the events and their significance from the MBR point of view. So when the encryption client was installed, what could have taken place, and what may have happened when the MBR infection occurred. So what could have been the sequence of events? That's the third question. Now, what is the solution to the problem? We've strayed away from the original problem, but something was wrong with the hard disk, and that's why we got these error messages. And uh, we see the problem now in the master boot record. We don't have the encrypted application's boot record, not even the original Windows installed master boot record content is what we see, but uh, we're looking at a malicious code. What do we do? We do a very simple operation. It's a lot e easier and simpler than most restore operations. What we do is the contents of sector, sector 6.3 will have to simply be copied back into uh, sector 0 to replace the master boot record that is in there and reboot. This simple operation resolved uh, the issue, and from then on, everything was working all right. Thank you very much for your interest and attention, and I wonder how we're doing in time, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And those who know 
the answer to the three questions. Please come up to the rostrum and we'll discuss the answers.